While the Grand Canyon State is named for its one-mile-wide, 18-mile-deep gorge, a hole with more square footage than the state of Rhode Island, it's also home to lots of little holes, namely hundreds of asbestos mines. And their story all begins with today's asbestos artifact, Chrysotile, Arizona. Minor asbestos deposits were also found in Arizona's Grand Canyon, but the largest and most valuable deposits of asbestos were discovered in Gila County. In fact, of the 103 documented asbestos sites in Arizona, most of them are found in Gila County. And the county's first little asbestos mining settlement would grow into a town that took its name, Chrysotile, Arizona. This book was written by Gene Nucky, who is apparently the grandson of Frank Nucky, the superintendent that ran the Chrysotile, Arizona-based mining operations of Johns Manville. As we've covered in many videos, in the 20th century, Johns Manville, or JM, was by far the largest producer of asbestos in the world, with the planet's largest deposits around another town in Canada, creatively known as Asbestos, Quebec. As you'll learn, that perhaps poorly chosen town name is not unlike this one. And imagine that, a guy from Asbestos, Canada, actually did come up with the on-the-nose town moniker of Chrysotile, Arizona. But more on that later. Let's back up a second and understand exactly what Chrysotile is. To put it simply, all Chrysotile is asbestos, but not all asbestos is Chrysotile. Asbestos is an industry name for a group of minerals with useful properties, like being strong and resistant to elements like fire, rust, and electricity. There are six types of asbestos, five of which are from the amphibole subgroup and break up into sharp, needle-like fibers which can be added to other materials like cement or vinyl or tar or glue to fireproof and strengthen them. Now the other type of asbestos is chrysotile. Instead of sharp, straight needles, chrysotile's fibers are curly, like snakes, hence its classification in the serpentine rock group. Also known as white asbestos, chrysotile is like a cotton plant, fluffy. It can be spun into thread and woven into fabric or flattened into paper, but it's made of rock. So instead of burning like cotton or other plant material, it can sustain flame and very high temperatures, so it was used in buildings, vehicles, and work sites of all kinds. Asbestos was used in all kinds of products like irons, stoves, Zippo wicks, fire blankets, safes, electrical wiring, and even Hollywood snow as a replacement for the cotton fibers that could ignite on hot studio lights. The problem is asbestos wasn't really safe. Its microscopic curly fibers have no taste or smell, and they can be easily inhaled or swallowed. After a few decades, the embedded fibers cause diseases and cell damage, including cancer. A German mineralogist named Franz von Kobel first gave chrysotile its name, combining two ancient Greek words, chrysos meaning gold, and tylos, which he intended to mean fiber, but it actually means eyebrow hair. So chrysotile technically means gold eyebrow hair. Okay. Gene Nucky, the author of this episode's artifact, based the book on his grandfather Frank's notes as superintendent, as well as discussions with other family members he named in the book. Frank himself had come from Cornwall, England, and worked in the De Beers diamond mines in South Africa. He emigrated to America through Ellis Island in 1907 and worked as a mechanic in various places, finally leading car tours along the Apache Trail in Arizona. In the 1920s, he ended up managing the asbestos mines in Chrysotile, Arizona, until they were closed in 1945. Mining asbestos rocks in the early 1900s was no easy feat. The canyon was hard to reach, and instead of a push car and railroad, they had to use burrows to move all the rock out of the mines and onto the mill. One of the more interesting details that I haven't seen elsewhere is that the name of the town was apparently proposed by a Johns Manville employee that came to scout out the mines in 1916. When he returned later that year to purchase the mines for JM, he announced that the town would now be called Chrysotile, after the type of asbestos they intended to mine. In Nucky's book, the man's name is given as an aside, a Mr. C. H. Shoemaker visited the town. But that name jumped out at me, because I spend a lot of time researching and thinking about the history of asbestos, and C. H. Shoemaker is in fact Clyde H. Shoemaker, the vice president of JM's mining and manufacturing division in where else? but Asbestos Canada. I couldn't get any confirmation if Shoemaker is responsible for the insight to the name Asbestos as well, but at the very least, he probably considered it a kind of spin-off. Another Asbestos artifact from our collection is this publication of the Quarter Century Club, given out at a dinner which honored JM employees who had been at the company for at least 25 years. And we found a copy of the publication given to the earliest members, and among them 
was Mr. Shoemaker. In fact, Mr. Shoemaker was fairly notorious in the asbestos story. He admitted to not enforcing guidelines on workers' masking and argued that health and safety standards were perfectly fine when the asbestos dust was thick enough to clog the respirators. And when the miners finally unionized and declared a strike, Mr. Shoemaker gave them the runaround to such an extent that the workers showed up at his hotel and told him to leave town. He did. JM and several anti-union newspapers reported it as them beating him and him having to flee, but subsequent investigations showed those stories were made up. At any rate, the image of working at the mines overseen by Nucky's grandfather Frank in Chrysotile, Arizona, is decidedly more peaceful and bucolic than the one Shoemaker oversaw back home in Asbestos Canada. In fact, Gene Nucky's book, Chrysotile, is filled with interesting details of how a collection of miners' tents grew into a true company town. Nucky says that literally every resident of Chrysotile worked for JM. They strung lights, put in a post office, and held dances for the workers twice a month. Warm in the summer, mild in the winter, though some years everyone enjoyed ice cream made from the local frozen waterfall. Most men worked a year, then moved on to the white lights of the city to spend their cash. In Chrysotile, the men would spend their money on clothes, shoes, food, medicine, and gas at the mercantile store run by Jin A Kuang, a well-known 32-year-old Chinese businessman living in Tucson whom Nucky hired to run the boarding house for the miners. Nucky's book doesn't mention Jin A Kuang, but an Arizona journalist named Linda Gross found Jin A Kuang's exit interview by U.S. immigration. Mr. Kuang described instructions from Mr. Nucky as, quote, operating a first-class general merchandise store at a reasonable profit and furnishing the mine employee with good food at almost cost. Kwong would also cash the company's paychecks and take a trip to Globe for supplies and food for the 150 Johns Manville employees living in Chrysotile. Jin A Kwan was a natural entrepreneur having emigrated from China as a laborer, but eventually organizing pop-up tents to sell food to the miners. With an apparent talent for engendering trust, he secured from Mr. Nucky what was a major contract. In 1920, JM did $40 million in business. That's the equivalent today of more than a half a billion dollar company. By the time of his exit interview, Jin A Kwan was returning to China as a wealthy 72-year-old man well thought of in his community. But the town of Chrysotile, Arizona, wouldn't be so fortunate. We'll take a look at that in part two.